Again, I want to be clear that these things don't necessarily on their own have to be like a sign that you're like for sure mentally ill. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapist things on this channel. Today we are kicking off a new series of videos that I'm making for May Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and today specifically we're talking about some surprising things that are actually a sign of mental illness. There are a couple of things that I wanna talk about in today's video because oftentimes they get overlooked or like written off as like, it's fine, it's normal, whatever. And I wanna be clear, it's not that these things are like abnormal necessarily, um, but they may be good things to keep an eye on um, when we're talking about like whether mental illness or uh, mental health issues are showing up in our lives. Also, if you're new here, hi, thanks for coming. You should subscribe. We make content like this, but we also talk about pop culture moments every now and again, so I'd love to have you stay. Before we get into the things, I do wanna be super clear though, that all of the content on this channel and especially in this video is intended to be broad strokes education and for us to learn and educate ourselves. This is not therapy, it's not a replacement for therapy. It never has been and never will be. You can't do that over the internet and it's also illegal to try. So to be super clear, that's not what we're doing here. If you do need a therapy, Therapist, there are always links in the description to go find one for yourself. So without further ado, let's get into the list. Thing number one is physical pain. This does come with a caveat to be super clear because people can have physical pain for lots of different reasons, <laughs> um, which I think everybody is aware of to be fair, but physical pain and sometimes unexplained physical pain and uh, irritations and things like that can sometimes be a sign that there's something going on for us on a deeper mental level that warrants our attention. The reason that I say this is because our mental health wellness, um, our mind is obviously linked to our bodies. Um, and it's like a pretty well established or um, supported phenomenon in the research that our body holds on to trauma and things like that. There's uh, a very cliche phrase that therapists love to use, which is that the body keeps the score. It's the title of a book. That's the whole thing. That's a conversation for a different day, but it is entirely possible for our bodies to physically store the remnants and the impacts of trauma. And so especially if you're noticing that you have physical pain in a particular area that doesn't seem to be related to like a physical injury or something like that, and it has some kind of relation to maybe something traumatic that you went through or something that like is related to your mental health, this can be a conversation that you can bring up with a therapist, that you can bring up with a doctor to talk about like, I don't know, is this a thing I should go to therapy for? And so there's lots of different uh, resources at your disposal there. But I just want to encourage folks to be aware of this because like I said, oftentimes it gets written off as like a it's fine, everybody has aches and pains thing. And it could be that, to be fair, it could very much be that. Um, but again, it could also be a sign that there's some mental health stuff that we need to work through. Thing number two is constant fatigue. The reason that I bring this up is, is similar uh, as the aches and pains thing, but also because oftentimes people, especially in the world that we live in, we sort of normalize this like excessive productivity, this like uh, workaholic attitude, and it can sometimes mask the side effects or symptoms of mental illness. If we are, for example, a person who survives something traumatic and our nervous system hasn't regulated itself after that event, we might be in a state of uh, hyper arousal is like the fancy therapy word for it. Oftentimes people call it fight or flight. We might be in that place, which is causing us to feel constantly exhausted. So if you're noticing that like no amount of sleep seems to help you feel less fatigued or that you tire very easily, that you just feel drained a lot of the time. Again, this is something that you can bring up with a therapist if you have one, or it can be something that you share with a therapist um, if you want to find one, et cetera, et cetera. And again, these are also useful conversations to just be doing reflecting about, talking with like a primary care physician about, um, anybody who's like helpful in providing care and support to you, this is something that we can bring up and talk about because I think, again, just as a society, we should really stop normalizing people being fucking exhausted all the time because while it is common and something that a lot of people experience, it is not something that you have to just write off as a, like a foregone conclusion or an inevitability. You'll just be exhausted for the rest of your life. That's not fair to you um, and it doesn't have to be true. Outside of like chronic fatigue syndrome and things like that, that's a whole different thing. I'm not a medical doctor and we don't talk about that here. So from the like mental health perspective, again, I just want to encourage people to be aware chronic fatigue can be a sign that there's, again, some stuff to work through. Thing number three is avoiding activities altogether. Um, especially if you're avoiding things because you're uncomfy or you're feeling this general sense of unease, um, this is something to keep an eye on. Because again, oftentimes we as, as a society normalize things that we shouldn't be normalizing, if only because it can cause folks to go longer before they get the help that they deserve. And so if you're noticing that there are certain things that are just off the table for you altogether, because emotionally, psychologically, you're having a hard time feeling okay to do them, 
That, again, is not something that you have to put up with. These are things that are very figure outable um, in therapy or with professional support. And I want to encourage people to be aware of that because in an ideal world, people should be able to do the things that they want to do, feel called to do, or to try new things and stuff like that. And so, again, while it's perfectly normal to feel nervous or like a little anxious before you do new stuff, it is, again, just not something that we should be writing off as like just part of your life that you can't try new things or do the things that you want to do because you feel so uncomfortable because again that's not true thing number four is appetite or sleep changes the reason that i bring this up is because when therapists are screening for particular mental illnesses one of the questions that we can sometimes ask is have you had any significant changes either to your appetite or to your sleep this can be either eating or sleeping less than you normally do or eating or sleeping more than you normally do. And I want to be clear, this is a anti-diet culture, um, fat positive and body positive space. So I, I want to be like clear with that, that when we talk about like eating more than you normally do, it's not from a diet culture bullshit place of like, don't be eating that much when the calories and whatever. That's not what this is about. It's just about assessing whether you as a person are outside of what your normal is and feels like. The reason that this is important for us to assess is because oftentimes if we have underlying mental health stuff, again, we can see that reflected in our physical selves, meaning, you know, the way that we sleep or eat or like feed ourselves. The reason that I bring this up is because oftentimes people are aware if they're sleeping more than they normally do or eating more than they normally do, but we oftentimes, again, as a culture, for a whole bunch of different reasons, don't assess for the other side of this. So I want to encourage people to be aware of both because both, again, can be signs that like there's something hinky going on. There's something that might warrant further attention. Thing number five is a loss of interest or joy in things that used to be interesting or bring you joy. This I think is like a fairly obvious one, or at least it feels obvious to me, but it's worth noting because again, in the world that we live in, people can sometimes write this stuff off as like, Nah, whatever, like people's interests, uh, you know, like ebb and flow or like, of course, you're having a hard time feeling joy about stuff because like the general state of things, you know. But again, this is not something that we should be writing off as just like it's inevitable that because the world is kind of fucked up that you'll like lose your sense of joy in things. That's not true. We can very much honor the reality of scary and traumatizing and difficult things happening in the world and also be in a place where we're able to to find our own joy, to reclaim our own time, to feel comfortable and safe and healthy and happy, especially within our own support system and within our own community, that is very much a realistic goal. So I do want to encourage people to be aware of that, especially again, if there's something that happened that was shitty or felt bad, and then there's this loss of interest or joy, that's like very much noteworthy and like a super easy conversation to host with a therapist about like, hey, this thing happened, now I feel this way, what do I do about it? Um, that's very much the bread and butter of what therapists help people work through all of the time. Thing number six and our last thing is intrusive or obsessive thoughts. Um, especially with the way <laughs> social media and TikTok uh, have been have been, I think there is a lot more discussion about intrusive and obsessive thoughts than there has been, which to be clear is good. And I think it's really uh, meaningful and important that we're destigmatizing having these conversations. However, I want to encourage people to proceed with an attitude of caution because sometimes when we colloquialize a term like intrusive thoughts, we're doing it in a way that isn't reflective of what it actually means. And so then people who struggle with actual intrusive thoughts can feel like, oh, that's not what that is. And so like, you know, I don't really need to investigate this further. And that might not be true. To be clear, intrusive thoughts Typically, when we talk about them in a therapy context, we're referring to thoughts that just happen. They're intrusive because they <laughs> intrude themselves into your mind. Um, and like nine and a half times out of 10, they're unwanted thoughts. The fancy therapy word for this is ego dystonic, but basically this means that like you don't like these thoughts. You're not wanting to think these things. They're not resonating with your core values. And so sometimes they're also disturbing in nature. Having intrusive thoughts like this is very much worth paying attention to and giving like respect and, and giving yourself the time and space to receive support around that because again, I really want to stress that they can be overwhelming and sometimes traumatizing and people can feel a lot of shame about intrusive thoughts. Um, so having this show up for you is again, very much a figure outable issue uh, when we're working with a therapist, but also something that's important for us to like, again, give that space and respect to because having these intrusive thoughts does not mean that you're a bad person. It does not mean that there's something wrong with you. Um, and it does not mean that you want these intrusive thoughts to be true. It's just sometimes a way uh, that our brain 
functions for a variety of different reasons. This can happen um, as a result of a bunch of different mental illnesses. But regardless of that, it's important if you want support, if you're able to access the support that you um, feel empowered and like, okay, to access that. Because again, this is very much a workable thing. Again, I want to be clear that these things don't necessarily on their own have to be like a sign that you're like for sure mentally ill. But I do just want to encourage people to be aware of these, especially if they're creating distress or frustration for you. Because I think also one of the things that the therapy community has done a pretty fucking bad job of is making therapy feel accessible to people or like people are allowed to go to therapy if they don't have one of the like um, most severe uh, symptom presentations uh, at like, you know, one end of the spectrum. And that's not true. Lots of people can go to therapy for lots of different things. You don't have to be like the sickest person um, or the like most overwhelmed or most stressed or most anxious person to be deserving of therapy. That mindset sucks. So if you're noticing these things and you're feeling some type of way about it, please know you are always welcome and allowed in therapy. And there are lots of therapists who would love to help you work through your stuff. So if you like the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel. It really does help support me um, and the work that we're trying to do here. Um, um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help the channel grow. And I will see you guys next time. Hope you like it.